Chapter 4, Searching Having spent just over two years with his father-in-law in Sharagrad, Reb Nassim returned to Nemerov for Sukkis of 1795. He was given a separate room in his parents' house, where he lived with his young wife. Though his father continued supporting him to enable him to carry on with his studies, Reb Nassim gradually started taking part in his father's business activities. He learned the value of different kinds of merchandise and gained experience in trading. As time went by, he became an astute businessman in his own right. That winter, Reb Nassim began studying in the Nemer of Vais Medrash. His study partner, Reb Lipa, had grown up among the Hasidim and had married into a Hasidic family. As Reb Nassim's study partner, Reb Lipa was in a good position to put the case for Hasidus. But Reb Nassim, whose mind still echoed with his father-in-law's ringing diatribes, stood his ground. We can try to imagine their arguments and counter-arguments. The Misnagdim saw themselves as following the traditional path of Judaism. Their main focus was Torah study. They held that self-development came primarily through developing the intellect, and they believed that only a learned Jew would be able to continue and transmit the proud heritage of Judaism. But the Hasidim countered that as a result of the Misnagdim's intellectual approach, which was only for the elite, the bulk of the people were left with a superficial perception of the Torah. This left them vulnerable to the attacks of the Maskilim. Moreover, the Misnagid's exclusive interest in Torah study meant that his devotions tended to be dry and lifeless. He felt little warmth, spiritual uplift, or closeness to God while praying or performing the mitzvot. The Hasidim, for their part, gave equal emphasis to other aspects of Jewish practice, especially prayer. The Hasidic path was one in which spiritual fulfillment was achieved by putting all one's energy into joyous observance of the mitzvos. The Hasidim valued the efforts of the simple Jew, even if he was not learned. However, the Misnagdim took the view that Hasidus fostered a neglect of the details of Torah law. For example, there were Hasidim who put so much emphasis on their state of mind when praying, that if they didn't feel ready to pray properly in the morning, they would delay their prayers until they had prepared themselves. As a result, they would pray after their permitted time of the morning prayers had passed, in clear violation of the Shulchan Aruch. Another contested point was the Hasidic leaning towards open discussion of the Kabbalah. This was much feared due to Shabtai Tzvi's and Yaakov Frank's use of Kabbalistic teachings to mislead so many others. Again and again, Reb Lipa and others argued the merits of Hasidism with Reb Nassim, but still he held aloof, adhering to the viewpoint of his father and distinguished father-in-law, both of whom held him in high esteem before he became a chassid. They would even argue over which of them he should stay with. A full year passed before Reb Lipa's words began to penetrate Reb Nassim. Reb Lipa claimed that the chassidim had a deep fear of heaven. Having visited some of the leading tzaddikim of the time, he was able to bring personal testimony about their awesome spiritual levels and the sincerity of their devotions. And with this argument, Reb Lipa touched Reb Nassim's sore spot. If God is good, why do we not feel this goodness? Since attachment to God means being attached to good, one should be filled with delight when serving God. As great a masmid as Reb Nassim was, and no matter how much he excelled in his studies, he was fully aware of his lack of inspiration in both his studies and prayers. He acknowledged, at least to himself, that he was unable to concentrate on his prayers. And where were his devotions leading him? The Mishnah and Avos teaches better an hour of repentance and good deeds in this world than all of the life of the world to come, and better an hour of the world to come than all the life of this world. This Mishnah clearly teaches that one can attain a feeling in one's devotions in this world comparable to and even greater than all of the world to come. This obviously troubled Reb Nassim. Why don't I feel the joy of devotion, Reb Nassim asked himself. After all, there are great tzaddikim who feel it. As is evident in their devotions, why can't I? Reb Nassim knew he must search for the right way to serve God. He would use whatever means he felt were necessary to help him discover the truth of Judaism and attain genuine spiritual devotion, even if it meant taking a stand that would upset his parents and in-laws. As Reb Nassim contemplated the merits of Hasidus, a man from Anapoli passed through Nemerov. Invited to a meal, the man washed his hands for bread and recited the appropriate blessings with deep concentration and enthusiasm. Reb Nassim was very impressed by the man's devotions and asked him if he knew Reb Zusha. 
Of course I know him, the man answered. I see him very often. Every bit of enthusiasm in my devotions comes from him. The chassid then began to tell of Reb Zusha's fervor. When it's time for chatzais, Reb Zusha throws himself out of bed and cries, Zusha, Zusha, get up already. The rest you can sleep in your grave. The chassid then went on to describe Reb Zusha's other devotions. The man's enthusiasm in his devotions and his reports of Reb Zusha's awesome fervor were convincing evidence of the vitality and viability of Hasidus. Reb Nassim saw that the Hasidim were truly God-fearing and began traveling to the followers of the Baal Shem Tov. The next five years, from 1797 to 1802, were spent in many a Hasidic Rebbe's court. Reb Nassim visited the followers of the Holy Magad of Mezerich who lived in the nearby Vinitsa area. Among them were Reb Zusha of Anapoli, Reb Lev Yitzchak of Berdichev, Reb Baruch of Mezhebez, Reb Gedalia of Linitz, Reb Shalom of Probisht, Reb Avram Dov of Chmelnik, and Reb Mordechai of Kremenitz, among others. Reb Nassim began to learn how to channel his energies into his devotions, and his, de- and his desire to serve God like the great Tzaddikim increased. Having tasted the warmth of Hasidus, Reb Nassim remarked, The difference between a Hasid and a Misnagid is like that between a warm and a cold Knish. Both have the same ingredients, Yet the cold one doesn't taste nearly as good as the warm one. Reb Nassim began to feel an improvement in himself. A new vitality came into his prayers, his studies, and indeed all his devotions. Yet he still felt that he was not receiving proper direction. He was unable to attain full concentration during the prayers, and he was still subject to repeated distractions when trying to study. He was confused by the fact that he was learning from some of the greatest tzaddikim of the generation, such as Reb Zusha of Anapoli and Reb Levi Yitzchak of Bredichev, holy and learned people who were able to infuse literally thousands of young Jews with religious fervor, yet he felt unfulfilled. What Reb Nassim was missing was a way to translate the teachings he received into action. How do these teachings apply to me personally? How can I come to serve God properly through these teachings? He wrote in his diary, I received a little awe of God and improved in a few areas that I alone am aware of. Still, I was lost on the path, unable to distinguish between right and left. I did not yet have a proper teacher. The beginning of the 19th century was a crucial turning point in many ways. The American and French revolutions heralded a new era of fledgling democracies. The incipient industrial revolution was to alter the face of human society. Within the Jewish world, the Russian decrees and the growing Haskalah movement were to bring devastating changes. At this fateful moment, 40 years after the Baal Shem Tov passed away, the movement he had founded to revitalize Judaism was beginning to lose its spark. In earlier days, Hasidim would gather to speak words of Torah and discuss religious devotion. At the gathering, they would drink a little schnapps. But as time passed, the schnapps became the focal point while talk about serving God tended to become secondary. When Reb Nassim first became enthused with Hasidus, he thought these gatherings were helpful. He disagreed with a friend from Nemrov, Reb Zalman Decliner, who argued against this practice. Before long, however, Reb Nassim began to think differently. It was during this period that he was chosen to go out to buy bagels for a Malava Malka with the followers of Reb Levi Yitzchak of Bredichev. His dejection over his ups and downs, even after becoming a chassid, made his childhood question about the purpose of his life more bitter than ever. Was this what I was created for, to buy bagels? Reb Nassim was at a loss. On the one hand, he seemed to have everything. He was a young man just past 20, from one of the most prominent and wealthy families in town. He was extremely learned, and his deep sincerity made him a favorite of all who met him. On the other hand, Though married for more than six years, he was childless. Esther Schengel had miscarried several times in the second trimester of her pregnancy. Even more upsetting was his lack of progress in serving God. He was very envious of some of the elderly Hasidim and Nemerov, in whom he saw true sincerity. He kept searching for someone who would instill in him that same love and devotion to God. No matter how hard he tried to climb the ladder, he still kept on falling down. A further twist to his predicament was the fact that his family was very upset with him. The mere mention of Hasidus was enough to arouse Rabbi David Svi Orbach's wrath, 
let alone the thought that his son-in-law, whom he saw as a diligent Torah student with a brilliant future ahead of him, was embarking on this path. During the years Reb Nassim was becoming interested in Hasidus, he was hesitant, even afraid, to travel to Rebbe David Tzvi. His friends advised him not to go so as to avoid the dreadful reception that would certainly be waiting for him. Let your wife travel there alone, they said. But in the end, Reb Nassim decided to go anyway, and in later life he always thanked God for that decision. Had he not gone, it is very likely that a rift in his marriage would have developed, leading to divorce. One winter, Reb Nassim was going to stay with his father-in-law. A friend asked him to deliver a letter to Rabbi Mordechai of Kremenitz, which was near Sharagrad, where Rabbi David Tzvi was chief rabbi. Reb Nassim was very fearful of his father-in-law's anger if he found out that he had visited Rabbi Mordechai, and therefore did not go to him until Pesach, a few months after his arrival. Rabbi Mordechai wondered why the letter had been delivered so late. With his father, his father-in-law, and even his wife against him, Reb Nassim swayed back and forth. His inner frustration gave him the push he needed to visit the tzaddikim, but the lack of appreciable progress in his devotions caused his resolve to falter, and he stopped short of committing himself as a devoted chassid to any of the leading tzaddikim. It is easy to understand why Reb Nassim did not make the journey to Rabbi Nachman at this stage, even though the latter's reputation had already spread throughout the Ukraine. At this time, Rabbi Nachman was still living in Zlatopolia, a journey of hundreds of miles on horse-drawn wagons. Why should Rabbi Nassim risk further opposition from his family when, based on his experiences to date, the hope of salvation was marginal? Another factor was that in 1800, the Shpala Zayda began a relentless campaign against Rabbi Nachman, causing a shroud of mystery to descend over the Rebbe's true identity. The opposition grew so strong that throughout the Ukraine, even far to the west where Reb Nassim lived, Rabbi Nachman's followers were ridiculed and despised. The antagonism toward Rabbi Nachman and his Hasidim became so intense that there was no justification even to contemplate such a journey. Both Reb Nassim's father and father-in-law thought he would eventually assume a rabbinical position. From his youth, however, Reb Nassim shied away from this. He did not want to use his Torah as a means of earning a living, in accordance with the rabbinic teaching, do not make them a shovel to dig with. Better, he thought, to have a store where he could buy and sell. His father could help him set him up in business, his wife would be able to assist in the store, and this way he would be able to spend more time on his studies. By the summer of 1802, Rabbi Nassim had more or less settled into a life of Torah study and business. He would spend much of the day in the base medrash, with several hours devoted to earning a living. Occasionally, he would make a business trip to Berdichev and other cities. In order to be a greater asset to his father's business, Reb Nassim decided to relocate to either Berdichev or Odessa. As he started preparing for the move, his father-in-law notified him that he was due to pass through Nemirov shortly. Out of respect for his father-in-law, Reb Nassim postponed his move. As it turned out, Rabbi David Tzvi's visit to Nemirov was delayed until after Sukkot. This was due to direct divine providence. Rabbi David Tzvi was a formidable opponent of Hasidus. Who would believe that it was his delay in coming to Nemirov that allowed Rabbi Nassim to become a Breslover Hasid? For that September of 1802, shortly before Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Nachman moved to Breslov. Rabbi Nachman was born in 1772 and raised in Mezhbush in the house of the Baal Shem Tov, who was his great-grandfather. In 1785, Rabbi Nachman married and moved to the small village of Osatin, near Medvedevka, close to the Dnieper River in eastern Ukraine. From the day of his wedding, Rabbi Nachman began to attract a following, though he kept himself hidden from most people until he was almost 20 years old. In 1791, he moved to Medvedevka, where he became a well-known Hasidic master. As with all Hasidic leaders, Rabbi Nachman attracted a mixed following. Some were simple people from the surrounding areas. There were those who came primarily to hear Torah teachings, while others sought Hasidus from a tzaddik who could inspire them to serve God. Like the other Hasidic masters, Rabbi Nachman had an inner circle of followers who were truly great men in their own right. Rabbi Nachman taught that the tzaddik is like a seal. It is impossible to read the inscriptions on a seal because they are in reverse. Only when they are imprinted on wax can one make out the letters and designs on the seal. Similarly, it is impossible to understand what the tzaddik is in himself. The only way to have some grasp of the tzaddik is by looking at his followers. 
upon whom the tzaddik has imprinted the stamp of his teachings and devotions. Rabbi Nachman's inner circle included several men who were older than himself. Rabbi Shimon, five years his senior, had been his first follower. Rabbi Nachman said of him that he had broken all his evil traits. Rabbi Yudel, already middle-aged, was deeply versed in the Kabbalah. Of Rabbi Shmuel Isaac, it was said that the Rebbe led him on the blade of a sword. So sharp and intense were his devotions. Rabbi Yekusil, a disciple of the Mezutra Magid, was himself a Magid in the Ukraine, with no less than 84 villages and towns under his authority. Rabbi Yekusil was around 70 years old when he became a follower of the Rebbe. His son-in-law Rabbi Yitzchak and his follower Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac were outstanding scholars and practiced their devotions with the greatest intensity. Another of Rabbi Nachman's leading followers, Rabbi Aaron, who had been appointed Rav of Kherson while still in his teens, was an outstanding halachist. When he later arrived to take up the position of Rav in Breslov, Rabbi Nachman said, Not only do we have to thank him for coming, we have to thank even the horses that brought him. Rabbi Avram Petterberger was a wealthy, highly intelligent writer. It was he who wrote down a number of the Rebbe's lessons given in Medvedevka. Rabbi Ber was a young follower who influenced Rabbi Yudel and Rabbi Shmuel Isaac to travel to the Rebbe. He always gave 20% of his income to charity and said, With my Chomesh, my fifth, I have nothing to fear before the heavenly tribunal. In 1798, Rabbi Nachman made his pilgrimage to the Holy Land, returning to Medvedevka in the early summer of 1799. The following year, without any prior notice, he moved to Zlatopolia. It was there that he began to face opposition. One of the chazanim in the town was upset that the Rebbe did not appreciate his cantorial prowess. The Rebbe said that the cantor sang for his wife, to impress her. The cantor took revenge by slandering the Rebbe to Reb Arya Leib, the Zaydi of Shpala, who had long been friendly to him. From then on, the Zayda began a relentless campaign to persecute Rabbi Nachman and the Breslover Hasidim. Having once lived in Zlatopolia, the Zaydi was not without influence. He came to the town and turned all the residents against the Rebbe. Not content with this, the Zaydi tried to incite other Hasidic leaders against Rabbi Nachman, calling on them to put him in Kherim. This was strongly opposed by the leading Hasidic figures, including Reb Leib Yitzchak of Berdichev, Rabbi Gedali of Linitz, Reb Baruch of Mezhbiz, and others all of whom wrote to Rabbi Nachman supporting and encouraging him. When the opposition from the Shpal Zayda became unbearable, the Rebbe went to his uncle, Rabbi Baruch, asking for a place where he could live quietly without opposition. Rabbi Baruch suggested Breslov and arranged with the leaders of the community of the town, Moshe Chinkis, Avram Pius, and Rabbi Mordechai Rosenstadt, that Rabbi Nachman be accepted there. They undertook to provide the Rebbe with his livelihood, even giving him money for moving expenses, and later became very friendly to the Rebbe. Rabbi Nachman arrived in Breslov on Tuesday, the 10th of Elul, September 7th, 1802. He said to Rabbi Yudel, I see a soul in the Ukraine near Breslov, referring to Rabbi Nassim, and went on to speak about the greatness of this soul. Tuesday was market day in Breslov, when people from the surrounding towns and villages would come to buy and sell. People who came there from Nemerov returned home with reports of Rabbi Nachman's arrival. During the week, the Rebbe became known as one who rejects the schnapps gatherings. He had said, I despise their self-made holidays. The reports spoke of how Rabbi Nachman talked only about Torah and tefillah, prayer, and required his followers to confess to him. Because of this, his followers at that time were known as vidoinikers, confessors. Someone in Nemrov called Valchi Nisanals made fun of the Brest of Rechassidim because of their confessing. But Reb Naftali, who had been a very close friend of Reb Nassim from early childhood and was also searching for the proper path, said to him, This is what you ridicule? This is exactly what I'm looking for. There was a folk saying, A pitkil yid, which means for a minimal fee one can see a good Jew, a tzaddik. Breslov was only a few miles from Nemrov, and Reb Nassim thought that now, with Rabbi Nachman so close by, he would be able to travel to him, and perhaps at last find a mentor, one who would help him discover himself amidst his sea of internal turbulence. Reb Lippa spent the following Shabbos, the 17th of September, in Breslov with Rabbi Nachman. 
returning to Nemerov on Saturday night for the first Slichos, where Shoshana was just over a week away. From the vigor and intensity of Reblipa's prayers, Rav Nassin and Rav Naftali could see how inspired he had been by his visit to the Rebbe, despite the fact that he had been practicing Hasidic customs and devotions for so many years. What especially impressed Reb Nassin and Reb Naftali was that in the Anenu prayer toward the end of Slichos, when most people tend to hurry through the lengthy petitions, Reb Lipa said every word with feeling. The next morning, Sunday the 22nd of Elul, September 18th, Reb Nassin decided he would make a short visit to Breslov. Perhaps the Rebbe could help him. Reb Nassin's father had gone to Berdichev on business, which removed a major obstacle, and Reb Nassin left immediately in the company of his friend Reb Naftali.